done this every other year, every odd number year since I've been here. I've done one of these seminars, and, and, and these are great. Um, it's, it's intimidating to be the last one because I followed all, so many nice talks, and now I have to live up to that. Um, but usually when I do this, I talk about a broad overview of what we do in my lab. But today I want to talk about one really exciting project that I was involved in over the last uh, few years um, that culminated with a, a, a pretty neat um, field ex excursion this past, uh, this past winter. Um, and the project, the acronym for it is uh, SALSA, which stands for um, Subglacial sub Antarctic Lake Scientific Access. Um, and uh, what we're looking at here in this little title slide film is a 360 degree camera a few hundred miles from the North Pole where our, or from the South Pole where our camp was. And this is what it looks like at the bottom of the Earth. You know, just the sun spins around um, all, all day, it never goes down. And uh, you can see our activities um, as, as, we, as the sun spins around us. So um, this is where we were on, on a broad, flat ice plane. You can see there's not much topography there in this 360 degree view. And uh, we were there to access um, a lake that was underneath this ice and to find out what was in there. So I'll tell you more about that in a, in a second. So I guess this is our advance. So of course this is a, a large scale project and it involved many, many people, not only from USF but from uh, quite a few different institutions, uh, which I've listed here, and I won't read them out. This is our science team uh, waving to a drone near the end of our, our expedition. Um, and, and you can see where we are, we're just out on the ice, not much, not much to see out there. Um, and uh, from USF, it, uh, the people who deployed were myself and my grad student, um, Ryan Venturelli. So um, we, were, we were out there on the ice, but uh, we had a lot of help from what I who I will now call the Jim. Um, I saw on Chad's slides, Jim Mulholland at the at the Marine Shop, the Jim. Uh, <laughs> we had a lot of help from from Drew with a with a CTD and uh, and, and, and quite a number of other people here. So um, a lake in Antarctica, right? You just saw a picture. It didn't look like there was a lake there. Well, if we were able to lift up all the ice in Antarctica um, over the past uh, twenty or so years um, through a lot of satellite information coming from there. We've come to realize that um, there's a lot happening at the interface between the ice and the continent. And um, this, uh, this diagram is kind of showing that with a, a whole bunch of networks of um, ice streams and, and wa running water underneath these glaciers. And these little dots represent some of what we think are the hundreds, hundreds of Antarctic subglacial lakes. And um, one of the most famous ones, of course, uh, happened to just be a nice flat section of the ice where the, uh, the Russians wanted to build a, um, their research station close to the South Pole. They picked that spot because it was flat, and it was flat because there was a big lake there. So um, when they went drilling through the ice for some long ice cores, the ice is about 3,000 meters at this point, um, they, got, they realized that there was a lake there a little bit too late before they um, dumped kerosene drilling fluid um, from their borehole into that lake. So th this one is, is famous for that, um, but it's also been contaminated by our activity. And I'll get back to, to why that's important. If we want to study these from a biologically st biological standpoint, of course, we don't want to dump kerosene in there in, in accessing them. Um, so, you know, just like any other continent, this is a continent with, with lakes and rivers. They just happen to be under kilometers of ice, okay? And so, so why would we be interested in this? And um, our project SALSA, when we have a nice acronym like that, it's easy to just constantly say SALSA and refer to it as SALSA. I think that our, our, our subtitle is important, though, and, and it's, it's an integrated study of carbon cycling. In, in, in this area. And the reason why was because there, there were, even though Lake Vostok was contaminated by accessing it, there were still hints that there was life. And think about that. There's, if there's life in these subglacial lakes, um, what's fueling it? How did it get there? How long has it, has it been there? Has it uh, diverged evolutionarily? Or is it, is it you know, one of the, the roots of life on Earth, right? Um, so this is one of the reasons that we wanted to, to access some more lakes. And this uh, effort in Salsa was following another effort called Wizard, which um, accessed a lake down here. 
Um, so Lake Mercer is right here. And Lake Mercer is interesting because its drainage basin, um, these are the Trans-Antarctic Mountains through here with some of these uh, glaciers draining out of them. This takes ice and water from East Antarctica and West Antarctica. And for those of you who are familiar with that, you can kind of divide Antarctica at the, the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. And West Antarctica is, is thought to be um, relatively unstable because most of the ice is grounded below sea level. And that means that if, if we get warm water into there, we could have a catastrophic loss of ice and feedback into rising sea level. Whereas East Antarctica is much larger and a lot more of the ice is grounded above sea level and therefore is thought to be more stable. Um, some of those views have changed recently, but um, Lake Mercer here is interesting because it takes uh, ice, water, and sediment, therefore, from both sides of the continent. And uh, we were interested in the sediment from both a habitat, a reservoir of carbon, and, and an archive. Um, and this is sort of our conceptual diagram of the project. It was, it was transdisciplinary in that we have people that were studying the sediment, and that's sort of USF's role in this project. But we also have people that were interested in the water, the ice, the rock, and of course all the nexus of all these interfaces are um, looking at the microbial pathways that are cycling carbon and what the source of energy would be under in, in this unique environment. Um, and this has applicability not only to origins of life on Earth, but also if you wanted to search um, other planets for life, this might be the type of environment that um, one might expect to find it, or maybe not a few decades ago, but maybe now we would. Um, so, um, and I'm going to get into the science, but I figure that, you know, we're used to working on ships and on, on small boats and everything, so I wanted to give a few slides to, to life um, on the ice in Antarctica. And this is our, our village here um, that was set up. Uh, this is a picture from a drone that's flying roughly over a, a skiway that was built the year before we went out here. So it's a long two-mile skiway to land large cargo planes, the LC-130, which lands on skis. Um, and all of this equipment, uh, after the, the flights and everything, it was about a million pounds of equipment, was dragged out by these types of tractors here the year before we came out. And it was set up for uh, mostly, all of this is the hot water drill equipment. Um, this tent was built here the, right before the scientists arrived, and that was where we had our meals and got warm. And this over here, which expands a little bit outward, is, is our tent city. So this is where we were living um, in Antarctica for in, in a tent. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, the, these two buildings were important. Um. <laughs> Y'all, okay, good. I don't have to go any further with that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this was our working platform called the Lars Deck, and this was a, a picture of our coring device that was hoisted up into a, a practice hole, and this is our borehole into the ice right there. Um, a lot of our cargo was put in lines so that when it got windy, we didn't lose it. It had to be tied down, similar to a ship. That was surprising to me. I thought this would be a little easier that we didn't have to tie everything down. Well, you do have to tie everything down, or else it goes endlessly down the ice in, in, in these windstorms. And uh, just to give you an idea of that, here's, here's an example of one of these windstorms. Um, oops. Let's see how I can start this. How do you start this? Uh, use your mouse, baby. Use a mouse. Oh, there we go. I think I have sound. So this was a hole ripped in the tent by some 40 mile an hour winds that blew all night. So. This was an excellent condition tent. So, um, you know, the, the, not only did we, you know, as Jackie was shocked to find out we lived in this tent city. All the nice tents, by the way, were for camp staff. The scientists, we had to bring these, these tents that were listed in excellent condition. Mine was only listed in good condition. And when I saw this excellent condition one get ripped, uh, Way and I were on the same line. And we, for privacy, we were on the outside of tent city, but we failed to pay attention to where the wind was coming from. So we called our, our line of tents the Great Plains. We were taking, we were on the windward side of, <laughs> of, the, uh, of Tent City. So uh, I was his neighbor and I was a little worried about my mind made it the whole time. Though, so that, that was good. Um, we did have um, creature conference. We had a little you know, Christmas celebration. We had a Christmas tree. We had some fun with, uh, with snowmen. Um, and now back to, to science. We had the, uh, <laughs> 
to access this lake, I, I mentioned that these were more or less observed first by satellite. And, and um, the observation was that portions of the ice would move up and down several meters on different time scales depending on, on, on the feature. But um, sort of through, almost through process of elimination, uh, uh, Helen Fricker, who's one of our, our main scientists on this project, came to the conclusion that these must be lakes right, underneath. And, and um, you could make some hypotheses about the depth of the ice and what the pressure would be and if, if it were possible to have the, the proper pressure temperature um, to, to maintain liquid water at the bottom of the, of the ice. And this is, um, so, so in some of these, they'd been instrumented after the satellite observations had been instrumented with GPS. And, and this was uh, from Lake Mercer. Um, and you can see here uh, several meters of elevation change and then a big drop. And then we climb up again. Okay, and this is over the course of about, you know, from 2008 to 2019. So uh, a little over 10 years, we see two cycles of what was um, thought to be a fill and drain of, of these lake systems. Now, at this point, we haven't accessed this lake. Um, and, and, you know, back at this point, when this was observed, we hadn't accessed any of these lakes except for Vostok. And um, we didn't know how far these lakes drained or filled. So we use this sort of height to, to estimate what the, the minimum depth would be if it were to drain all the way to the bottom. And uh, you know, we didn't know if it would drain all, and empty all the way out before it refilled again. Um, this is sort of a, a plan view of, of the elevation change from, from the satellites showing that uh, you know, there, there are parts that were moving more than others. This is our, our, where we ended up drilling. Um, and you can see that the estimate, estimated height was about 11.5 meters. Um, for the for the minimum lake depth, all right, and uh, this kind of shows a scaled match between um, two different satellite uh, efforts, or actually three different ice sat, cryosat, and then the scaled GPS, um, which which uh, gives us a few more data points out here. But you can see that these these lakes are going through fill drain cycles, and lucky as we were, we ended up accessing the lake right after maximum fill during a drain cycle. Now. Of course, we, we wanted to make sure we got it just in case the lake drained all the way. We wanted to make sure we got there before all the water was gone. But this is really interesting from a geophysical standpoint to be able to maybe go and measure current or, or some other things that would be related to these fill drain cycles and, and figure out what was going on. This is a picture of our drill, our hot water drill. And all it is is basically a shower head um, pushing out hot water in a, in a, in a conical form. Um, and you can see that it's you know, cutting through the ice and it's the same amount of energy coming out. So depending on how much energy, porosity and everything else in the ice, you can see it cuts quite in a regular hole. And basically the width of that hole is determined by how fast you send the drill down. We were going at about, I think, point, uh, point 0.38 meters a minute or something like that. Um, so uh, this is when it was uh, just drilling through the fern layer here. And this thing around the edge here is our UV collar. Um, I mentioned the, the contamination of Vostok. That we were doing what's called clean access, and that means we didn't want to in, in, um, introduce any chemicals or any um, uh, bacteria or any other um, biology to the, this lake as we accessed it. So every, all the equipment had to be hosed down with, um, with hydrogen peroxide, and then uh, we would put it through this um, this UV collar, and this is, as far as everybody was concerned, the biggest, strongest um, UV light known that has ever been made. And then the point is that when you when you close the the iris over this, as you get your equipment down, everything that you're feeding through off of the winches, um, uh, rope, and other are then um, basically uh, sanitized by the by this strong UV light. Um, so. This is a picture of us hosing things down. Now, actually, this is a picture of us taking some of the water. So this is a closed system that gets filtered, and, and it goes through its own UV light. So the water that we're introducing has to be super um, clean. And this is a picture of us taking samples for uh, just to do cell counts and to make sure that the water actually was clean. And this is what we found when we got the, uh, the, the, the hole drilled. Um, Basically, you go down this hole, and when you get to the lake, you pop through, and because of the hydrostatic pressure of the ice, it fill, it, lake water pushes up into that hole. So we have a hydrostatic water level here that was about 101 meters below the ice surface. So the first 100 meters of that hole were, were very cold air, about negative 20, negative 30 degrees 
Celsius. And then you get into the water, and most of this is our drill water until you get down into this area where you start to get mixing of drill and lake water. And we would watch our, our salinity. Our salinity is very, very low, um, you know, almost like DI water in the lab, but it jumped up a, f a few microsiemens down here. And uh, this was our, our, our lake. And it looks little compared to the, the, the column of ice, but it was actually about 15 meters deep. So between the lake ice interface and the lake sediment interface, we have about 15 meters, so a little bit higher than what the satellite motion estimated. All right. <coughs> so um, we also got our first video of basal ice. So this is a camera being deployed down the borehole. Here's our UV lights going on. It's also the first footage of those UV lights because nobody ever wanted to film that. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting into the water at about 101 meters um, and going into the part of the borehole that's filled with water. Why, why do you need this music? Hmm? Why do you need this music? It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> 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 now this is actually ice. Um, with, with particles in it. So this is, this is what we think is accretion ice that's so it's being frozen out of the lake and there's got to be an interchange. And you can see here that it, it's very clear in some places and you can see bubbles floating out here. Um, this is the lake bottom. Um, you see some large clasts and some, some pebbles. Uh, there were parts of the basal ice that, were, that almost looked like rock but it was still ice, it was, it was rock dominated instead of what we saw there, which was water dominated. And that's very important, right? This is a first image of what is at the boundary between ice and continent down there besides the lake itself. And, and that's very useful for, for geophysics. Um, now in the water column, we found uh, living cells. These are stained, fluorescent stained cells. Um, five microns, that's about all I know. That's, that's my, the extent of biology for me. Um, <laughs> thanks, Maya. <laughs> I was really scared about this slide. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the thumbs up. Uh, so uh, we have, um, this is Christina Davis's work um, where she has taken some, uh, s some of the um, uh, filtered water and, and put it onto carbon limited media and find stuff that's growing on it. It's not methanotrophs, but we, we were wondering, you know, if this um, ecosystem would be carbon limited or not. But she's also probably more interested, more interesting to us here at USF is she's measured some ammonium oxidizing bacteria, bacteria in archaea, um, which suggests that there could be chemolithal autotrophy going on underneath, uh, underneath all of this ice. Um, so that's exciting. Um, and, and, and would imply that maybe there's, uh, from the water column, DIC that's in the water column that could be ultimately sourced from the ice would then be put into organic matter and deposited into the sediment, right? <coughs> now, our role at USF was mainly in the sediment coring, okay? And uh, we wanted to core the interface between the water and, and, and the sediment. We used a multi-core. So those of you who've worked on the oil spill and the mud and blood cruises, you're familiar with multi-core. This is a little tiny one to fit through the borehole. It's only three barrels. Um, and it was, it was very labor intensive because a lot of this is rubber, supple rubber that seals and, and allows you to take a good core while preserving the sediment water interface. But you have to pull that through 100 meters of negative 20, negative 30 degree um, air after it's been wet. And if it freezes and you lose the seal, you lose your cores too. So it's very tense moments, but um, on our first two deployments, we got three out of three barrels full. Our next two deployments, we got two out of three. It was, it was tremendously successful and we got really good um, recovery of the core water interface, the, uh, the sediment water interface. Um, now, USF's main role was to, to build and to use a, a large core um, to not only, to, you know, once we have the sediment water interface, we wanted to penetrate deeply into the sediment and kind of use it, act, um, <coughs> exploit it as a record or an archive of carbon cycling in this environment. Um, so this is a, a picture of that. And of course, there are you know, a lot of problems in how to do this through a borehole. Normally, if you want a, long, a big long core off of a ship, you have a big giant column of weights that has a large diameter, um, so you don't have to deal with the height of it. You, know, you just need a, a, lot, a, a lot of uh, weight. So we, we wanted heavy weight, but we only have a small cross-sectional area to work in. 
Um, and we also wanted to make sure that we got a good core. You saw the bottom there where we had lots of rocks and pebbles in this glacial till. We needed to hammer through that. So we wanted high kinetic energy. We didn't think that a typical gravity core where you're just letting a winch pay out as fast as it can would work. Um, and at the same time, though, we wanted to keep it simple. It's in this freezing environment and everything. So um, what we ended up doing was we used um, uh, the now... Uh, no longer used long coring system from Woods Hole. And we just had to modify this column of weights on top, the silver part, and we used their core barrels here. Um, so I had a modular weight system, 250 pounds each. We'd go up to, I think, about 1,200 pounds of weights plus then the weight of the core barrel and the core liner. We had a Teflon-coated Teflon core barrel. Um, and uh, we were able to use this simply as a gravity core, which we tried at the payout speed of the winch. We got about 1.4 meters of penetration but we inverted our core fingers and lost the first core. Um, after that, we had an innovation here where we were able to let this core free fall for several meters to get much higher speed than the 50 meters per minute. Um, and that's shown here by this animation made by one of our cinematographers. This is a messenger going down the borehole. Um, it's a 40 pound messenger. It took about uh, a few seconds to get down there. And, it and what, what it does is it cuts a rope, releases a, a hook, and, and it's a braille release, and just released the whole package for about six to seven meters and got us deeper into the sediment. So we get about um, normally more than twice the penetration using this apparatus. And this was new. This has never been used before um, off of a ship or in a borehole. Because of contamination fears, it's never even been tested before. This was its first big test. So it worked, and it worked spectacularly. We got um, the longest cores ever taken from this sort of environment, which is you know, one of those dubious <laughs> records because not many cores have been taken from this sort of environment. But <laughs> we're the record holders. <laughs> so, um, uh, and this is just an example. This is a, you know, you can see mud all the way up to the, the, the collar here. So we had really good penetration. Our cores weren't that long. We, had, we didn't have enough exhaust coming out of the top, so we probably pushed sediment down lower, but we got really nice long cores. Um, and this is what they look like, and this is, this is great. Um, this is a, a, a CT scan, just like you would get at the doctor, hopefully never, but if you do, this is what it looks like. It kind of can scan through your body in different slices. So this is going through this core right here, and you can see we have all this structure on the top, pebble layers, laminations. Then we get into what we thought we would have all the way through, which is this, this glacial till. Um, these are our two, two of our 10 multi-cores, and these are our deeper cores here, which show some evidence of layers similar to what we're interpreting as lake sediment all the way down here. So there could have been several um, sort of lives of this lake in this place um, capped off by, by glacial, you know, basically toothpaste-type sediment that's marked by the, the glacial system. Um, <clears throat> So we're interpreting this as lake sediment in the multi-cores. It's lower density. We're interpreting um, maybe similar to that. This is one of the hypotheses we're testing in these deeper cores. Um, this was uh, from our, our uh, meeting in ISIS where uh, I got to talk about the coring and Ryan Venturelli got to talk about the, the actual science that we're doing with it and data is just pouring in now. But one interesting thing was that there have been efforts to get sediment from underneath the ice. As I said, it's geophysically interesting. Not from lakes, but th these are from the formerly known up B, up C, and up D ice streams with a timeline here. Um, and, and there were piston cores taken of, of this sediment. Um, not from lakes, but from under the ice. And the, one of the, the well-known authors, uh, Cam, said that uh, cores from ice streams will invariably consist of dark, gray, wet, very sticky, clay-rich diamicton, which is this stuff here, that shows no grading, bedding, or other structure. Well, by coring into this lake and doing it in an innovative new way, you know, we, we were able to, to show that that's not the case. And there is a history recorded in these sediments. And now we're just trying to figure out what exactly that is. And that's, that's pretty exciting stuff. Um, so a few words on that, and then I'll be done. Um, this is a, a nice block diagram that Ryan has drawn um, showing the, the Ross Sea coming in and getting pinched off by the ice and contacting sediment. This is a modern grounding line, which is the furthest extent to where the ice is on the ground on this side, and it's floating on this side. So ice sheet, ice shelf, if you want to think of it that way. Um, we are working with a, a, a core that was taken just um, uh, seaward of the, of the grounding line um, that was taken during the Wizard project, and we're using that to compare to um, subglacial Lake Mercer. And um, 
what we want to do is we want to sort of develop a carbon cycle model. And we, we, we're measuring this. In my lab, we do a lot of isotopic work. So we're doing carbon, stable carbon isotopes, C13 to C12 ratios. We're doing C14 work, so radiocarbon. This is an environment that should have been, uh, you know, not, um, should have not had any light, any sunlight coming into it for uh, perhaps millions of years. Um, the, the, the furthest back we can use radiocarbon to measure anything is about 60,000 years. So one of the hypotheses going into this was that we would not see any radiocarbon. And any life in here was based on very old relic organic matter that had been um, you know, CO2 that was re reduced way back when this, there was no ice. Okay, so we have the water column. It's interfaced with the sediment. And then within the sediment, we measured some you know, pore water uh, DIC and, and um, the actual organic matter in the sediment itself. Uh, Ryan has just gotten an internship at the National Oceanographic um, Sciences Accelerator Mass Spectrometer. And we'll be doing a lot more um, radiocarbon work than we thought we were originally able to do. So that's great. Um, in the field, we took some of our cores and we pupped them because we basically wanted to give everybody a chance to, to get some of this valuable material before um, we brought it back to the United States. And we wanted to do it in a way that wouldn't contaminate the majority of it. So we looked at interesting parts through non-destructive um, analysis. We picked out where we were going to puck them. We took a bunch of samples. Um, and the other samples went back to the repository. That's where we got the CT scans. And this is what Ryan does with the samples, and a lot of people in my lab do it. They, they take sediment and they turn it into nothing in glass. So that's CO2 from the organic matter. Um, and at the same time as Ryan's doing this in this environment, sort of uh, Dylan Peck, I want to bring Dylan's work up. He's working on a similar environment in upstate New York that was probably covered by ice um, at, the, at the last glacial maximum. Um, and he has lake sediments from there, which we're investigating as to how, how can we interpret the radiocarbon and carbon isotope signals from these environments. A little more is known about that, about Dylan's environment, because it's no longer covered with ice and easier to access. So it's a, it's a really nice um, combination of work that's going on now in our lab. Um, so right now, our preliminary uh, results, stable carbon isotopes, all the way down these cores, it suggests marine organic matter. So, um, you know, at some point when there was no ice or, you know, there, there was deposition of marine organic matter, um, one of the issues with it is it's extremely low sub 1% organic matter content. Um, and in terms of the radiocarbon, most of what we've measured has virtually no radiocarbon like we originally thought. The DIC of the lake water, the pore water DIC, sedimentary carbonates minerals in, in the sediment. But there is some radiocarbon in the sedimentary organic matter, and that's what Ryan's been looking at. So it's about 11% of what the atmosphere was in 1950. That It's not 100% because it's been decaying, probably. And that works out to be interpreted as an age of about 17,000 years, which is not an age you would expect there to be a marine incursion or something like that. This is, you know, there should have been pretty solid ice over there. So we're trying to interpret what, what this means. and. Uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the main questions is how can we explain the carbon cycle if sediment organic matter is the youngest sea reservoir, right? We would have expected that to be accepting, for instance, the ammonia oxidizing bacteria in archaea. We would expect the sediment to be made up of that, but coming from dead or very old DIC in the water, we wouldn't have expected the sediment to be the youngest part, the sediment organic matter to be the youngest part. So, um, so mysteries abound. Um, so at that, I'll, uh, I'll take any questions.